you you buy a, a certain product, the money goes to a certain place, uh, and that you have no maybe you have no real say on wh where the Anthropocene is going, but the people you give money do. So the, the choice is to make. Um, so that's planetary desire, like everything is now an ecological battle, not for a local niche, but for the biggest niche possible, which is the biosphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Welcome, guys. So we're here with Edwin Bywater, who is a, uh, a friend and a brother from the Intellectual Deep Web and the uh, European Men's Movement and all of that lovely stuff that we're involved with. Um, Edwin, you're you're interested in, I guess, ecology, the environment, but not from this environmentalist perspective. No. I guess is perhaps, and that's something that we can maybe tease out as we go on mm -hmm. through this interview. But we were just saying now, I think it'd be a nice way to kick it off, just to ask you to just kind of introduce yourself and the project a little bit. Like, what is it? Who are you? What are you trying to achieve with this book that you're writing at the moment? Which is the reason we decided to do this interview in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um... I um I I'm an engineer by trade or whatever you want to call it. Um, I studied engineering starting when I was fairly young and uh, graduated when I was I thought I was young, but I was uh, I thought I was old by then, but I was probably young in the sense that I didn't really know what I was going to do with my degree and you know with my my skills at that time. That was back in, in 2014. It's about 28 years old. And um, I started working as an engineer, did various things, a lot of like data analysis in various applications like biotech and uh, industrial uh, applications. I had a, an IT firm for a while and I kind of jumped between jobs and I, I kind of didn't really have a plan. Uh, I felt that I had not only kind of good mathematical skills and engineering skills, but also something else, which I felt I didn't get to sort of foster really like an interest in philosophy and an interest in society. And as an engineer, I guess I have an experience which is similar to many other, other engineers like, like you get put on some kind of, um, on some kind of rails and you're supposed to just run fast as hell or make your train go as fast as possible on those rails. And it's pretty, it can be pretty narrow minded. So I, I was jumping between different kinds of engineering jobs for that reason. Also started my own company for that reason. And then I kind of it dawned on me that I need to shift gears more violently, let's say. So I, um, so I started to study environmental science, which I did for two years, uh, master's and, now I've been working in that field for a little bit, and I've decided to do some independent research uh, for a number of reasons. Um, there are a number of reasons why I want to do research, and there are a number of reasons why I want it to be independent. Uh, so, so now I'm writing a book, uh, which you referred to as my my project. And um, yeah, so I mean, basically, there are so so many reasons why I do it, but but I think that we need a fresh start on so many levels when it comes to the to the environment so just to and i need a fresh start so just do me first quickly um for me being able to with the kind of sort of natural science background and the sort of interdisciplinary thinking that i've um sort of packed packed onto my <laughs> muscles the last couple of years with all the philosophical readings that I've always done because I've always been interested in that sort of on the side not taking any sort of uh, courses on it but yeah so I feel like I the thing that I really ought to be working with is ecology and the climate because it's sort of the biggest possible picture in terms of how our, our technology what it relates to so I know you guys are doing and I listen to your pod and I love it you know, it's it's a lot like how does technology interact with the human soul and the human subject, and I think that comes as a proxy for me. But I more kind of work with how does technology interact with with the planet as such, and what do humans tend to think about that? So uh, that for me is a sort of the, the the biggest possible 
scope or the biggest possible picture. Of course, like you could argue that, you know, theology is bigger or that physics is bigger or that uh, psychology, qua psychology is bigger. But like in a, from an engineering point of view, the, the biosphere is the biggest possible. So that's from that. And so, so that's the kind of the scope part. And then I, because of my training in various fields and my various interests, I, I really want to do something where, where I can be as interdisciplinary as I want to, which means I, I kind of, I mix analysis of art with uh, analysis of uh, uh, energy transitions. Like it's everywhere, ev everything in between and a lot of psychology, um, which has interested me for a long time. So that's kind of my bit and what, why I do it for, not for me, but for <laughs> the world is that I, I, I see so many problems with, well, first of all, what I, what I call kind of fake synergies in terms of it, in, the, in the polarization that we see in society. So you mentioned that uh, I, I write this because we've talked a little bit about, about it before. I do this, but I, I don't do it from an environmentalist perspective. Uh, and that's right. On the other hand, it's that's not an either or. And I'll just give you give you an example. So I in my <laughs> In my sort of social media life, my public life, my private life, I'm I'm quite an I'm quite an outspoken critic of woke culture and, and cancel culture and so forth. So, a lot of people who see that side of me will assume that that kind of that correlates with a lot of other uh, attitudes that I have that might be um, you know right wing or whatever, uh, and I don't. Uh, and then the the people who see the side of me that sort of cares for the environment and the climate, they will think I'm a communist or something, and I'm not. So th this is th these these correlations are completely fake, uh, and they've only appeared because people are so scared uh, of, of thinking for themselves that they that they they look for tribes, and the, the tribes have already made uh, packages. Um, uh, so yeah, and um, so so. I'm very much driven by looking at these kind of fake dichotomies and, and fake synergies between uh, opinions on the environment and, and the other you know, spheres that the environment mm -hmm. relates to and, and pick it apart. And like these, these are all interesting on their own merit and they don't, you're not supposed to think A just because you think B or whatever. They're, they're, so, so yeah. So, and, um, I, and I, I, and we really, really need better, philosophy inside of ecology so there is a, there is a, a field of study called eco philosophy uh, the only, only problem is that that much like many other disciplines of the humanities and the social sciences is, is so heavily politicized that I mean it would be one I, I I don't really have a moral problem with it being politicized it's just boring because it's always the same thing. Um, so if you look up eco philosophy and you look at the the sort of the the width of what people are saying there, it's pretty pretty narrow because they're not interested in in technology really, other than criticizing it maybe, and they just have different ways of criticizing um, technological development, which is fine. It's needed, but just it's very narrow. Um, they're not really interested in the future. And they're really not interested in intra-field criticism. So I really want to be sort of the person who says, you can do eco-philosophy without paying any sort of respect to your forebears. In fact, they're all the better for having, being disrespected, woken from their slumber, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's so what's yeah. So what would be uh, sort of a, a quick definition of your, uh, let's say, particular view on the environment. I mean, in the, in the emails that we exchanged uh, that you mentioned, econosense. Uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about what that means and, and what that means for your view? Yeah. Um, it's, I'll start with giving a really sort of pretentious answer. So the, the, the econosense, which is what is, the, that's the working title of my book, and it's basically a philosophical system. Um, it works from a number of principles, which I think I'll be getting deeper into now, but I can just on a surface level say that it's, it's a heavily kind of realist perspective, uh, realist both in the scientific 
uh, sense and also in the geopolitical sense, not least. So I, I do a uh, heavy sort of intermixing of environmental analysis and uh, geopolitical analysis uh, because many people don't also. It's something that's been, that people are shying away from. Um, but I, I, I've noticed that in order to understand, and I'm, I'm still on your question here, I've, I've noticed that in order to understand um, eco philosophy or eco-psychology, one really needs to, to look at the multi-layeredness of how we relate to the ecology. And that there is a, and that there are many such layers. I'll get into that also. But there's one layer um, which I call, and maybe I'm not innovating here. I, my people may, may have done it before me, but I'm pretty sure they haven't sort of um, done the same categories as me but I call it sort of conceptions of the mind of what our human um, relation to the human relation to the ecological predicament. You'll find similar terms like use on nature or nature relatedness or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, but I basically say that there, you can, you can break things down even further to sort of psychotechnologies and how we, how we relate to our own mind or whatever. And you can go further up in abstraction and, and look at like ideologies Mm -hmm. So, but this is kind of an in between where uh, how does a person or a tribe or a, or a collective, how does that entity frame what the human relation to ecology is? Of course, mm -hmm. that involves a lot of ontology and so forth. So, that's what ecognosis is on that level. So, I, I can just name a few other phenomena that appear at that level, and you'll see why. And I develop ecognizance as that which isn't all the others. So, um, for instance, I, I won't be like totally comprehensive here, but I, I'll name two or three maybe of these conceptions of what ecology is to us humans. Uh, first of all, I have something I call ecological consciousness, which is kind of a hippie new age notion um, that uh, humans are creatures that need to, on a spiritual level, come to grips with the kind of part of nature that they are. That involves a lot of, could be meditation, could be drugs, could be philosophical, spiritual musings. Uh, and there are many, many streams of, of thought that sort of borrow from what one could call ecological consciousness. But you know, you'll find people like Terence McKenna is definitely into that. The whole hippie scene was basically ecological consciousness, although they didn't only deal with ecology, of course, but to the extent that they did, they did it through this kind of means. You'll find um, kind of scientific innovators slash pseudoscientists, and I, I don't use that in a disparaging way, but like John C. Lilly and Rupert Sheldrake, who've had like interesting ideas about you know what uh, the nature of consciousness and how that relates to humans being different or not different from animals and how sort of biological information propagates all of that is ecological consciousness okay so uh no, a second a second sort of conception of the mind that appears on on this level of what ecology is is what mm -hmm. i call ecological awareness so ecological awareness is a far less individualistic and far more political notion uh and um basically a more or less a socialist notion where instead of instead of being in tune your consciousness in tune with the planetary movements of biology and life it's rather that you are aware of the ecological consequences on human society and societal consequences on ecology so rather than being sort of in a state of consciousness you're in a state of alertness and awareness and or relation openness, if you so 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 that and and i you know i could go on but but there are so many interesting things happening between those two i think you, we could we could go deeper into that but i'll, I'll just name because this is going to be i've kind of made these terms up but a third term which is being thrown around all the time which is kind of a third an alternative to these is um sustainable development so that's being used everywhere and that's basically a a neoliberal techno capital kind of accounting notion to how resources and, and ecology should be managed uh and you know people might say well how how is this 
the same as the two aforementioned. Well, they appear at the same level of, of conceptualizing ecology. And what I do is I conceptualize ecology on that same, exact same level, but I go through these three that I mentioned and more, and I, I sort of critique them. And by critiquing them and, and you know, picking the, the picking the, the raisins, uh, you know, cherry picking a little bit, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I, 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 I sort of build my own idea by looking at the field, what's what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I also look at more sort of hands-on topics and issues. And the way that I treat them, I, that kind of renders how... Uh, renders implicitly what my philosophy is. Uh, it's not a very good answer. I'm. I'm I, 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 look, like the, the best thing is. Keep, I love this. Keep, keep, keep these, throwing these me curves, and, uh, and you'll see. Yeah, no, no, man, Listen, like I was just yeah, yeah. thinking as you were saying that, like there's something incredibly Hegelian about this, like stepping out different forms of consciousness as they relate to their surroundings. And like, I've just been studying the phenomenology at the moment, but what's kind of fascinating there is the way he traces a kind of um, a chronological development through these different stages. Now, I don't know. Do you see any kind of hierarchy or developmental stages within these layers that there might not actually be one? Um, but I'm kind of curious. That's a kind of interesting question. Although I'm also mindful in thinking maybe it would actually be best to flesh out the other points because I, I've loved hearing your definitions mm. to this point of the kind of three that we've touched on. But, I actually think it'd be incredibly valuable yeah. for us and for this station to have all of the material open on the table. So I, I'll, I'll do your uh, I'll I'll do your first question first anyway because I, I just. I think it's a very, very important thing to mention here. Um, so for those who are familiar, um, there are, well, let's say you, you have, there, there's something called integral philosophy, basically. It's Ken Wilber kind of stuff. Many people will be familiar either with him or with metamodernism or metamodernity, as Danish intellectual Linne Bakel Anderson would call it. Um, and, and these things have a lot in common. And the kind of, and I don't really know Hegel that well, but uh, I don't know if that was purely Hegelian point you mentioned about developmental stages, but the developmental stages. It could just as well be more than that. They are very, very, very relevant to this. Uh, But I would say that out of these six or seven or whatever choices, basically, that the human psyche has to relate to ecology, only only those that espouse ecological consciousness consciously say that there are developmental stages because those are the only people that would really sort of engage with trying to conceptualize levels of the of the human psyche that way that's not to say that they're more which is which is incidentally the, the mistake that i think kim wilbert does makes is that there, there, there's some kind of implicit hierarchy there uh, and with my perspective, I have, have a heavily evolutionary uh, evolutionary perspective. I think that there's no guarantee that what is called sort of higher levels of consciousness in terms of how late they're developed, that putting emphasis on them will be ev- evolutionarily more successful. Uh, the, I, I have seen no evidence for that whatsoever. It could be the opposite. Like it could be that if you um, get too deep into your own head, Mm-hmm. whether that's an ecological head you're not going to reproduce as much so the the yeah so the, it's a very good question I, I i think that yes ecological consciousness indeed works a lot on the chakric systems and the the, the other sort of mm-hmm. ways of conceptualizing uh levels of the mind but but the others really don't um for for various reasons um but yeah um, what I find what I find really cool and I was I was just thinking is how rather than saying there are ecological levels of consciousness and as per integral theory let's hierarchize them and make some better than others but you you put the evolutionary point of view point of view on the table and you say that maybe out from these five or ten levels mm-hmm. of, of ecological consciousness, Maybe the ones that one constructs to be more complex and integrated uh, might not be the ones that are evolutionarily more tenable. 
uh, it might be a gesture of, or this is perhaps an impression, uh, especially when I look at uh, integral theory, it might be just evidence of different modes of thinking altogether. Uh, you know, the people who mm -hmm. are amber tend to be living in wealthy societies and mm -hmm. uh, have all of this money and access to all these books. And they think that, you know, you could postulate that that's a better way to think, but that's mm -hmm. all it is, a postulation. Mm -hmm. Whereas the cool thing about what you said is that it's a mode of interrelationship, right? It's, uh, you know, the, the, the psychological mode, if I got you correctly, and obviously we're going to dive a little bit more into that, mm -hmm. is a way to, it's, it's, it's not only a way to uh, address environments, but also a mode of addressing how man is towards the environment, the feedback loop. So mm -hmm. uh, what's the most ecological way for a man to be? Well, to yeah. be proper to its own nature. Well, then what is its own nature? Mm -hmm. To conserve or to burn it all in a consumptive rage? Great question. Uh, and, and so the question yeah. of the environment and the question of man might be interrelated or, or am I um, maybe missing something here? No, no, no. I mean, two very important things come up here so as as per the last thing you said um i i think that the the interesting thing about these uh, what i call like con conceptions of ecology they're mainly like with so many other things uh, i don't need to tell you guys this but it's kind of like like with so many other things the more unconscious it is the more powerful it is so if if you're reflecting right. on what you just said, like, what should humanities or my relationship to ecology be? Then the power that these memes have over you have already kind of lost. Maybe you're now slave under another level, which we yeah. can discuss. You Maybe you're slave on a, under an uh, ideological level or a, a deeper sort of, um, I don't know, uh, could be anything, could be some kind of formal level. I, I don't know, but, but mm -hmm. at least you've sort of by by noticing that these are the forces that move around on, on that level, um, you've transcended that in some direction. But what was the first thing you said? Because you had another point there. Uh, but yeah, just, mm. yes. So so the, the really cool thing appears when a lot of subjects are unaware of what yeah. their implicit bias is. So that's going to be an implicit bias, like we need to relate to nature in a spiritual way, or we need to relate to nature in a Marxist way, or we need to relate to nature in a neoliberal way or any of the others. When that's, you know, you've been breastfed with it or something, either mm -hmm. as a child or in college or whatever. So like when, when you're unconscious of your unconscious bias let's say mm -hmm. uh yeah that's what it, and and because most people are like even the people who work in these fields are um really maybe they so, so, yeah so, yeah so so, hmm. so could, yeah that's a, that's amazing could you maybe then for uh for clarity's sake for for our viewers and for us maybe uh you know what are the five mm. typical ways yeah. that people relate to nature through? So, so that yeah, so 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 I mentioned three, right? So that's that's ecological consciousness, ecological awareness, and sustainable development. So mm. they all have different goals, uh, and you know we could talk for ages about that. So the other three, uh, well, first of all, um, I, it's what I call uh, Earth stewardship. And the interesting thing about Earth stewardship is that uh, compared to the other three, it's it's far more dualistic it's i would say christian but it's probably monotheistic um and it, it places so you will find of course religious notions in all of the others but this is quite explicitly in the same way that ecological consciousness is explicitly new age earth stewardship has the idea that man stands apart from nature and that the culture of man is good basically um which is a notion that you will not find always in, in all of the others. They might be very sort of harsh towards human nature. But Earth stewardship says, yes, man is fundamentally good, but he has the capacity to do ill as well. He must choose good. And part of choosing good is choosing a sustainable life, either on a local level or, or a global level. So that's the kind of motivation behind that. And the interesting thing about Earth stewardship is that it's you will find it in primarily in two different groups politically. Uh, you will find it among conservatives who do care 
for the environment. There are plenty of conservatives who don't, and I'll get to them later. And you will also find them with, with sort of Green Party people. So Green Party people like in uh, the, the German Greens or the Swedish Greens and so forth, uh, they will usually have this kind of tendency rather than being of the ayahuasca drinking type or the Marxist type. They will more likely be this type. When mm -hmm. I say ayahuasca, I'm in ecological consciousness territory and Marxist ecological awareness. Um, so, right. yeah, so that that's, it's, it's like, um, and I, 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 I would say that this, Older people tend to think like this. Younger people are usually more of, of, of the other inclinations. So, okay. yeah. Mm. And that can be a generational thing or it can be an age mm -hmm. thing. I don't know. But Interesting. Yeah. So, mm. so it's, it's, it's as if you've identified a few topologies or a few modes of engaging with this problem of environmentalism. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of breaking them down and saying these, these, are, these are the, one that's, the ones that are out there. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I correct in understanding your project? And so... Mm. What's, that's part what's of your it. gesture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and let's, finish, what's the gesture let's finish the other two, please. And yeah. Then we... yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sorry. the other two. And, and we... So the, the other two are interesting. Uh, the, the, the fifth one, uh, I call it <laughs> eco-territorial supremacy. And because I introduced this now, I, maybe I have to take like one step back to the side. Um, what what eco-territorial supremacy is, is this. Let's say we live in a community and we have certain ecological practices. Now, you can have a very broad range for what um, ecological practices are. You know, uh, going to the grocery store could be part of an ecological chain, right? But yeah, but, but ideally, when we're talking about eco territorial supremacy, we're talking about a certain culture that does certain things to the land and to the air and to you know, other animals and to, to, to plants and so forth. So if, if we three are in the same tribe and we have the same relation to, um, to the land, that could be anything, by the way. We could be hunters, we could be gatherers, we could be um, agriculturalists, and we will have certain agricultural practices that are appropriate to our culture. If we think that is so good and we're so ch chauvinist, you know, then we're going to say, okay, even if we think that way, we have two options. Either we go imperialist and say everybody's going to do exactly like this. Or we go genocidal and, you know, do a Hitler and say, okay, uh, everybody's going to die who's not like us. Okay, That means with, with the kind of Hitler idea, you would get a kind of, for whoever espouses this theory, in theory or practice, very few people can do it in practice. We don't have that kind of, we have a multipolar world, right? So, but uh, anyone who thinks like this, so there's a difference between the imperialist or the genocidal part, but big difference, but, but still, they would, they would think that sustainability is important, but it's something that we can solve inside of our culture when we reach a breaking point. But for that to happen, our culture must be the dominant one. So that's eco-fascism, right? That's eco-fascism. You're exactly right. And the reason I don't call it eco-fascism is that that term has been thrown around for other phenomena as well. I can get into that. But, but yeah, eco-fascism is, is a... Um, it is so there are two reasons why I don't use ecofascism. Firstly, it can point different directions, but also you could be an eco-territorial supremacist yes. without really being a fascist. I mean, you could 100%. be a Confucian or a um, or an anarchist, like if that way of life. So it's um, it's basically a very sort of anti-diversity idea. It's the idea that we yes, we do care about our ecological predicament. But in our terms. And, and on our terms. So the best thing would be if everybody did the same, and that's the sort of asymptotic thing mm. we're staring for. And yeah, you, you can find this in ecofascism mm -hmm. proper. I would say Alexander Dugan, who was on your show, he's definitely an eco-territorial supremacist. Mm -hmm. uh, he maybe he doesn't say it, but he would definitely prefer if if uh, you know if Russia with whatever Russia is, with orthodoxy and their particular practices with, with oil and gas and the way they do agriculture. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details, but he would uh, think that is that is something that should have more 
levels around. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry if I'm just getting ahead of myself. I want to ask something re- regarding mm-hmm. this point specifically. So, so maybe two things. One is, would you classify the attitudes of the BPs and shells of the world trying to sort of push the burden of ecological awareness to their people. So you guys don't use plastic straws. We get to fucking dump the oceans. Would you say that attitude falls under this uh, ecological territorialism bracket? That's that's one question. And mm-hmm. I want to throw another one, which is, mm. interestingly enough, the Russians, they, they, they the global warming is serving their geopolitical aims very well. Yes, exactly. Right? Mm. So the Arctic is going to melt. Uh, mm-hmm. Tallinn, where I'm located, is going to have a tunnel to Helsinki that is going to connect to the mm-hmm. Arctic. It's going to connect to the new route to China. That's going to be pretty interesting. A ton of the, land in, in Siberia is going to be a hell of a lot terrible. better for uh, for agriculture. Yeah, yeah, or or uh, forestry. So yeah. And so Russia, for example, is kind of sitting in the backseat. Is like keep it going. And, you know, yeah. just keep keep. You're polluting. exactly right. So on the, yeah. So that's that's the thing, and that that means that we need to also really really understand that the separation of different ecological questions like climate. I mean, so so a lot of so a lot of different institutions some pretty clear cut and some murky in the world are pumping money into climate change denialism for for different reasons and yes of course some people stand to gain this is what but a lot of people are when i say a lot of people who do i mean well a lot of pundits and scientists inside of climate science and analysis they're pretty naive here because they they somehow think that Everybody stands to lose, but just some stand to lose a, a little bit less. Uh, but that's not the way a, a kind of a military strategist thinks. They think in relative terms. So if they can gain more power in a more chaotic world with with rampant sort of climate change and social issues on top of that, which will interrelate, mm-hmm. that's a big win for them. Uh, but yeah, so and he's not alone. Uh, he is uh, Putin, Russia, but uh, there are several others. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, of course, Russia bashing for good reasons, for this reason partly, but yeah, a lot of institutions worldwide are, are the same. Interesting about Shell and BP. There, I would say this. So, <clears throat> a, um, a smart big corporation would understand what I have understood. I don't know if they have, but they would understand something similar to it. This means they can do PR and they can greenwash using the whole flora around here. But their end goal, like, so whatever, the the point with these conceptions are that they're all kind of flawed, uh, which means that, like, if you're on top of that game, you're not going to be slave under any one of them. Um, So BP and Shell, yeah, they're definitely territorial supremacists in the sense that they would love to just be able to fill their pockets continuously um, for the time that they can still extract oil and sell it at a certain price. Um, Since they know energy, they're going to sooner or later, I've already started, of course, doing other. They, you know, they're probably partly owned by the same institutions that own uranium mining firms and so forth. So so it's all, you know, very, very interconnected on, on that level. But so I would say that, yes, okay, yeah, there's a certain sense of my way or the highway eco-territorial supremacism, but but it's it's a lot more um, rational than that. So eco-territorial supremacism is still some kind of emotionally guided idea, whereas, uh, you know, I would say, yeah, so they, they are definitely sustainable development Earth, and you will you will find uh, oil lobbies and so forth that are really really pushing the narrative of uh, fossil fuels improve. In fact, there's one that uh, uh, an NGO that's even called "Fossil Fuels Improve the Environment," the improve the planet, not improve the environment, but improve the planet. And they they go on to say, you know, that the level of um, at the level of uh, growth and so forth that we have is would have been impossible without fossil fuels, which is correct, sure. you know. But uh, yeah, so but so the yeah, I, I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A really big company like that, yeah. You know, mm. And but the last one, the sixth yes. one of these, is is what I call ecological nihilism. So that's basically a catch-all for not giving a fuck, which of course they also don't. So they borrow uh-huh, from all uh-huh. of these and understand how to play all of them in different kind of when they need to lobby or market or innovate, mm-hmm. or quasi-innovate or whatever. So they use whatever. Phenomenal. So yeah. 
One, one very quick ask. Could you enumerate all six so we, we yep. so they're present? Yeah. So uh, ecological consciousness, basically, is kind of new agey, to, to cut short. E ecological awareness, more of a materialist taint. Sustainable development, that's uh, kind of neoliberal accounting practices to, yes. to take care of these large-scale uh, issues. Earth stewardship, I mean, I don't know. Boomer humanism. But it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a Christian idea of we're going to be living in harmony in this way with the separation between nature and man. Uh, Eco-territorial supremacism, well, that mean that could be Christian as well, but just in a very different way, not in a universalist way. But it could right. be anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then and then ecological nihilism. So yeah, I didn't really unpack that one. That, that basically, that, there's interesting. I have a really interesting uh, anecdote for for ecological nihilism. I was. I was living in, I live in the south of Sweden, but I was living in, in Stockholm a couple of years back, uh, before Corona, incidentally. And um, I was I was visiting a Hare Krishna ceremony, ceremony a couple of times with a friend. And a very weird place, like Hare Krishna, they're everywhere, of course, so they're in Stockholm, and they have this you know, gathering place, really good food, and I don't really enjoy the singing for one and a half hours, but you know, could live through that to get the nice food and talk philosophy with these people later. I mean, that's nice. And the guy who was sort of chief monk there, uh, I started talking to him and I was like, yeah, I work with, with the climate issues and so forth and study that and uh, do, do bit, bits and pieces of it. And he was like, yeah, um, if you read the Upanishads and all that, you know, you will realize you know, it's deterministic. Yeah, you know, right now we're in this part of Kali Yuga and everything's going to be this kind of climate change. Who cares? You know, your mission, and, and they are the people, that they, I mean, they love, uh, they love ecology on another level, but, but not because they think that what they do matters. So because it's so determinist, it's like, yeah, no, no, no. The only thing you can possibly change is maybe your karma inwardly somehow. So that's interestingly enough. I mean, when you say Hare Krishna, you might think, oh, these guys, they care for the environment. No, they're nihilists, 100%. They, yeah. they, they're like, yeah, no, 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 no point doing that. Uh, yeah. Put their hands up. And maybe if you, if you meet them in one of the other yugas, they're going to say something different. Oh, now we live in the golden age. Yeah, you can dream big and build fusion power or something, but not in Kali. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I love about <clears throat> these six territories that you've mapped and illustrated so well is that they are very strategic mm -hmm. and applicable, or rather they are quite broad. So imagine if I have a billion dollars and I actually want to take some sort of action it is, I can imagine it's often the case that people look at one or two of these angles, but to look at all of them is a, is a way to ensure that you're not missing any of the potential other strategies of the people. Because while some people are discussing this very binary Marxist mm -hmm. narrative of, you know, it's the big capitalists like mm -hmm. quail people who are fucking everything up, we need to, uh, you know, take over the means of production, mm -hmm. they might be missing other factors such as, uh, the, the the supremacism of you know the ecological supremacism and the fact mm -hmm. that some people might actually w want to push for uh, uh, climate change and environmental alterations mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for other reasons. So I think that's really really uh, broad. Do you think you've covered them all, or is there like a seventh question mark one that or eighth or ninth or tenth? Um, I well, I I think I I think I sort of. Um, it depends if you see that if you see this as a, as a scientific endeavor. No, no, a purely strategic sort of you know you're yeah. advising someone with a billion dollars. I, I, like. I see what you mean. So, but but in, but in terms of seeing this as, um, I think because I have framed this, I've basically framed it so that this is comprehensive. But I could be mm -hmm. wrong. But 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 the framing itself, like I could make it a completely deductive. Pro process and say by definition it could only be these but then i there are so many other layers yeah. to this that, but that, that where i have question marks or it's more empirical than that and i actually don't know everything that exists yeah, on this yeah. level uh, but uh, yeah of, of course you know it I, I like hearing you say that that you 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 see this as a way out of the binary because that's sort of my most important point here um yeah if I may, what's also exciting to me is how 
it looks like one of these uh, strategy exercises that you order from big corporations. And it's like, yo, here's these six territories. Keep these in mind if you're going to take action. Mm-hmm. This, this study is not fully scientific uh, uh, and, you know, peer reviewed over 70 years, uh, which would be too late. No, it has this penchant for applicability. That's how I uh, intuitively grasp it. And I find that to be quite sexy, mm-hmm. if I'm being really honest with you. Are you familiar with the notion of next nature? No, but I but it, it brings up uh, it, it brings up a lot. A lot of things when I hear it, but I don't know what you're referring what to. What I'm referring to. <clears throat> no. I just wanted to, to drop that in because um, there's this design think tank in Amsterdam. Uh, it's you know part philosophy, part design, part uh, sort of design for debate and, and speculative design. And I uh, worked there for a bit. We actually had the founder in a podcast, Kurt van Menswert. The notion of next nature is just the idea that real nature is not green. Evolution goes on with us. The objective should not be to go to, and this is another avenue of thought, another angle in addition, or perhaps integrated into yours. And the idea is that we should not strive to go back to nature, back to an idyllic Eden, rather forward to nature. And, and um, Interesting. I, I know yeah. what you mean. I, 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 know, I know the sort of aesthetic branches that lean on that kind of thinking. Uh, I, so... Now, now that I could say, wow, okay, I really need a seventh thing. But I would say, and maybe I'm trying to say my own hypothesis here, but I would say that these people, uh, of which maybe you are one, uh, rest heavily on sort of because it's it's a progressive, it's a progressive idea that that is not purely materialistic. So it will be a little bit of ecological consciousness and awareness. So basically, some kind of push mm-hmm, or some mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. enablement of social change through how we see nature. Uh, I, I, when I hear it, I, I think of so many different kind of aesthetic. Like, I'll, I'll name a few things. Uh, there's a thing called xenofeminism, for instance, which mm-hmm. I think is must be heavily, heavily related to this. But rather than on the ecological uh, side, it's on the biological side and like self definition of right heavily transhumanist, right? So right. redesign uh, the female body so it's no longer so in the throes of its natural cycles. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and also post-gender in every which other way. Um, I mean, these things are all fun and games until you run into reality, right? So I don't know I don't know how possible these things are. And I, I like the idea of a next nature. On the other hand, biology is so, at the same time, resilient and fragile. Like you really can fuck things up mm-hmm. if you use your sort of headspace to sort of bring forth the next nature into the world rather than having to be, I think that would be my critique, although I'm not, not really going to be, I, mean, I, I, I could take another angle or not, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not really organic. It's uh, ironically, it's not really organic. And you get these, I, I, I think design is probably a design and architecture is, is probably not the main culprit here. If I'm going to talk about culprit, but but especially inside of literary studies uh, and well, especially inside of literary studies, you get these movements like climate imaginaries uh, and they'll spend millions of taxpayer dollars on writing quite bad prose. It's like bad prose, bad poetry, bad sci-fi uh, and publish it as papers. So there will be peer-reviewed papers, which are basically just very, very bad sci-fi of what the future, either a future post-apocalyptic world will look yeah, like yeah, or yeah. some kind yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. high or low text, saved climate, save the day kind of thing. Uh, it's... It's, it's, I, I think it's pretty weak. It's it's just yeah, it's yeah. not tied to the real world whatsoever, and it's yeah standing in the way of other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love when you bring up. I think you've you've you've, you've nailed it very well. I think uh, when you mentioned the progressive element to it, that it's something that says no, 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 no. Continue. Maybe even accelerate. Even though next nature mm-hmm. would be perhaps. A little bit le- more palatable to a more mainstream mm-hmm. audience than, say, xenofeminism or even mm. accelerationisms yeah. or acceleration acceleration esque yeah. of considering this. Um, and, and I also like that you made this distinction again. That's 
maybe because you're an engineer and I fucking mm -hmm. like that, which is this distinction between speculative imaginaries uh -huh. and the ability to like work towards proper interventions. Uh -huh. In other words, one thing is to, you know, come up with this bad prose and, and uh, exhibit it in all sort of biennales where uh -huh. you end up invoking the saints of Mandela and Pope Francis and Greta every single fucking time and Bono. Uh, and, and Oh, it's so radical. It's all radical and, and, and innovative, right? <laughs> but, and then on the other hand, you, 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 what I like about, you know, and there's a lot of funding, a lot of people fucking exist mm. within that culture production sphere. There are the priests that keep this bourgeois machine going yeah. on. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, the idea that we can be informed to the point that those small precise action can be impactful or, or impactful for some sort of agenda. Because in that sense, I'm also... Uh, territorial supremacist, not not in so far that that I have to take over the world for the, to stop climate change, uh -huh. but uh, in the conflicting pool of interests uh, of of the world today, multipolarity. It's uh -huh. it's I think it's kind of a re, re repetition of Machiavelli's Italy. In uh -huh. other words, a lot of a lot uh -huh. of interests, a lot of people playing. How do you act according to the interests that you formulate? What are those interests? I don't know, but like. It is possible to act and to make informed, precise interventions that are applicable yeah. and not speculative. And, and but, but but and yeah, but and, and then as soon as you say that, and I just want to like put in some kind of caveats here. As, as soon as you say that, you're going to be accused of being really lowbrow or whatever. Uh, and I think, but but so I love everything like speculative shit. Just don't put it on a pedestal and actually innovate. If you're going to do it, don't uh, regurgitate what you've been reading in your kind of cli-fi uh, magazines and just, yeah, I'm going to do my version of this. No, nah, you, you really, yeah, do something new for fuck's sake. And well, I, I like that you bring in accelerationism here because that's, because I, I kind of take a kind of an opposite take. I, I would say that for precisely the reason, for precisely the kind of Landian reason that uh, capital or whatever's going to replace it is unstoppable, uh, for precisely that reason, if you sit in your sort of armchair with an Apple MacBook in front of you and try to sort of um, overtrain and sort of cram in a kind of special aesthetic which you're going to place onto the world, for the precise reason that accelerationism is going on, that's not going to work. So, because that's always going to be kind of ahead of you. That um, progression is always going to be, <laughs> is always going to like smolder every kind of dream of having some kind of coherent aesthetic that you want to, it's, it's not going to yeah, work yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and yeah, sure, you can do it as a hobby, but don't have any hopes for it. Don't spend any taxpayer money on it. And, and like, instead trying to just, um, Stoke the stoke the sort of train with the right kind of fuel. This would be my, what's, would be my mm, yeah mm, yeah. What what's an intervention or a project for you? What's mm. a goal, a telos? Uh, mm. not the but uh. Yeah. So the t telos for me, that that's a good. I look. So that's another thing which is sort of my goal with. Okay, so first of all, uh, I I really like the idea. This is not really a tea loss. We'll get to the tea loss. I really like the idea of, on the one hand, doing a making a writing a book, old school shit, and then doing this, which is kind of the the other end of a spectrum. Whereas so many things in between, like I've worked in, in academia, I've studied a lot, I've worked in academia, I know what that's like. Uh, I know that, and I can say good and bad things about it. Unfortunately, a lot of bad things, and how how sort of academia plays together with the, the 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 sort of bureaucracies the government bureaucracies in a very unhealthy way which nobody's gaining from anyway so but the, like publishing that way is really not sexy for me but but on the other hand a book and this is and in terms of t loss i would say that in the academy you have a problem where people are producing pretty obscure stuff some of it, some of it is kind of unimpactful because it's technical and boring, and some of it is unimpactful because it's nonsense, like the bad prose I was referring to. So what they do, and what other institutions in society do, like NGOs, is they'll they'll say, "How is 
all of this wonderful science, some of which is real science, like, okay, uh, the the heat wave in Canada now, is it due to climate change? Well, yes. Uh, without man-made climate change, there could still be heat wave, but it probably would be, it would be less likely and would be 50 degrees and things are going to get worse. Uh, mm-hmm. I happen to think, you know, but yeah, you could take me up on that. But there's so much kind of real science going in behind that. Whereas you will find, and I'll, I'll take a, a wonderful example of what, 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 what fake science is, and I'll get to the TLOS through this. There's a really interesting, for all the wrong reasons, uh, project at one of Sweden's biggest institutes of technology. It's called Chalmers in Gothenburg, where I think it's probably EU funded. Uh, and and they, there are some people there um, working on, well, they're working on climate change denialism, which in itself is like, okay, fine, but are you going to spend millions on it? Like, I could give you an account of that in five minutes and all the various streams. I don't need to really, but yeah, okay. But but that and that's kind of fine in a way. But they then they go on to sort of work on how climate and consumption relates to masculinity. Okay, so then then we're opening up some some interesting avenues. But the thing is, the thing that's 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 flawed with this is not that they. So it's for me, it's fine to say like, yeah, okay, men tend to have bigger cars and eat more steak. So they're bad people. Okay, I'll say, okay, statistically and all that, probably you're right. Then for a lot of other reasons, this is a this is a kind of an unhelpful frame. But sure, you could say that. But the problem what these guys do is that they say that, and then they have another part of their project where they analyze um, masculine attempts at, at actually living more sustainably like and they'll they'll talk about like the Arnold Schwarzeneggerification of and then that's problematic too you see so you get a you get a double bind you get a, you damn so well, it doesn't well, matter what if you as as um, if you are uh, masculine by inclination if you are mm-hmm. spewing your masculinity inside sort of the the, the 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 wanting to do something about the environment, then you're a problem. And if you don't, you're a problem. So in many ways, kind of we, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, it, uh, yeah. Go on, go on. Sorry, go on, go on. Yeah, no, no. And, and I just want to say, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the telos. So that, um, <laughs> of course, that's a kind of a, a really bad spook that I want to fight. But then there are other spooks, like the fact that this kind of fake science and other things like it. Uh, like critical race theory or something uh, like, oh, we really need critical race theory in order to live in a more... No, we, we probably don't. That's just a grift. <laughs> um, but like, so these things will will simmer into society and it'll be picked up by uninformed people. And I want to do the exact opposite. I don't want to write anything that's <laughs> supposed to be understood even by ill-informed people because I don't care about them. I want to write mm-hmm. something that will be understood by people who can really are, are movers and shakers, basically. Uh, so uh, that's, that's all, re- kind of a landing <laughs> thing. Like I do, I do genuinely fucking care about nature and the planet and environment. I and love, I I love people yeah. who, who, who can do any, something about it. Read this, understand what, the, what the kind of territory looks like that you pro- probably didn't know before you read the book. That's my deal. Yeah. And that's that. the right mm-hmm. way to think it. Yeah. That's the right way to think about it. Um, when you were talking about the Institute, all that I was thinking about was, uh, people got to get paid and, th- and we have a, we're in late stage empire. There's a large group of people mm-hmm. that as has happened in other moments of crises in the English empire and in the French empire, there's a lot of people climbing the social ladder, but there's not not enough land for everyone, so to speak. So there's a lot of people with university degrees, but there's not, and make of that what you will, but there's not enough degrees and, and the promises of that social uh, climbing are not being fulfilled. It's not mm-hmm. like you have a university degree in, in, in the era of the boomers it, where everything would be good for you. It's happening now. As such, uh, you know, you got to get these EU-funded NGOs to fucking, uh, you know, it, I'm going to be like an asshole to get these people fucking rotating the fucking cycle of of, of whatever mm. mostly useless, useless skills they've attained. Useless because literally and technically useless, not being an asshole, but literally useless, as in what are you doing? What, do you, what is the effect that you're producing? That's been something that's frustrated me for all, all my life. 
which is why I always feel impelled to like, no, what can you do to sort of affect change properly and wisely and uh, wisely, not in the sense that then there's going to be a good way to do it, but you know, mm. at the end of the day, we'll all, we are all environment territorial supremacists, even these people who are take, you know, jumping on the man bashing train wagon to get a fucking, to get a paycheck. They are doing something that benefits them. Putin mm. is doing something that benefits them. Everybody's eating out of this egregore called climate change and environmental change. Everybody's benefiting, mm. even though different people tell different stories. And yeah, I, I, I like now. Okay. So I like, um, I like that you, you say everybody's an eco-territorial supremacist, although, you know, that that's, that's true in a way and, I'll, and, and it's true in the way, and it's true in the way that everybody's playing the game that I call planetary desire. So I, I'll get into that, but just like the thing about eco-territorial, I, I think like the, the three of us, I don't know, we probably have a lot in common. I think all of us really enjoy the fact that, that there is pluralism in the world, right? So even if, so our particular notion of, of that, and that's the reason we're not eco-territorial supremacists, because we want to be surprised by new cultural phenomena on a regular basis, right? So we don't want, we don't have this idea of a monolithic, kind of, or maybe, you know, you can, you, I think, I, I kind of know you guys, I, th I think you agree. So that, so that would be the difference. Whereas uh, the fact that everybody's fighting for, um, you know, hegemony. Right, yes, right. everybody's fighting for, for their particular, and that's what I call planetary, planetary desire. And it's basically oh. um, like, and, and, and the reason I, what that is, it's, it, it's like, our technical, so we live in the Anthropocene, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's that I take for given. I don't think that's any. That I don't think, as opposed to other heavily sort of politicized notions, I, I completely buy. We, we do. It, it's the people. assumption you start yeah. from, I mean, and that's not, a fair not one. Only, not only for for climate reasons, but also for land use and for, for basically everything. Uh, but there are good and bad things about us being in the Anthropocene. Like when it gives us certain powers, it also make, means that we can be self-destructive. So I, I, I don't take this kind of one-sided normative moralistic. But the fact that we live in the Anthropocene means that whatever we do, and this is kind of a radical notion that I have, like whatever we do, even in our, our sort of micro decisions and the micro thoughts that we have, because they per chaos theory, whatever, could have an, some kind of effect on, like some decision I make will have some kind of effect on what I do in life. And then that will affect the job I do. And that will affect, uh, so, and because we live in the Anthropocene, every, especially sort of every kind of ideological stance we take, every sort of consumption stance that we take and so forth, is part of planetary desire, whether we like it or not. So when you buy a certain product, you give money to people. And incidentally, I, I'm going to get, could get more into the various parts of, the, of capitalism that want different things because they, they also do. But you, you buy a, a certain product, the money goes to a certain place uh, and that you have no, maybe you have no real say on what, where the Anthropocene is going, but the people you give money do. So the, the choices you make. Um so that's planetary desire, like everything is now an ecological battle, not for a local niche, but for the biggest niche possible, which is the biosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, we're all part of planetary desire, although we're not, we're not supremacists. You know? <laughs> that's, um, that, that's the difference, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everybody's, <clears throat> everybody's, uh, everybody's an, uh, an evolutionary actor. No, so. It reminds me of this uh, idea, which... I share and, and next nature of courts, he also shares, and he has this very brilliant, succinct way of putting it, which is obviously much better than me in terms of how succinct it is, which is in order to serve the, to save the biosphere, we need to start with the mind sphere. Mm -hmm. And he says mind sphere. So as not to say new, new sphere, because that's a little bit more of a niche term, but mm -hmm. the point being, um, I think it resonates a bit with what you said with planetary desire that uh, every single meme that exists in this new climate that has appeared as a consequence of the Anthropocene, there's sort of this new level on top of the biosphere and on top of the geosphere, which is beneath it, which is the, either the technosphere, or you could also call it the newosphere, which is a 
frame that I like more because because uh, I like memes. And so, mm. Mm, do you feel like there's a resonate uh, th th that something resonates here for you? Yeah. Is that something that you that connects to your concept? Yeah, but of course, uh, it's. I think um, so. The interesting thing is there is a mirror here, right, between the external ecology of some kind of uh, exoteric world of cause and effect and some kind of internal world of, well, that which we cannot maybe even comprehend because we would be measuring on ourselves. and that's, that's, So, but I think a lot of like, so for instance, Gregory Bateson, uh, way back when or 50s and before, he, 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 um, stipulated this concept of uh, ecology of mind so and i think he, he rests heavily on the fact that, that everything is you know cybernetic and, and recursive outside and inward and there's a recursive loop between the out and the in and that's exactly why our minds are basically ecologies so you will get some kind of mirror there <clears throat> that resonates with me but that that wasn't really the important bit the important bit is maybe that I think, I think you need to understand the different. So when you say to to affect sort of good, whatever that is, change in the biosphere, you mm -hmm. need to first fine tune your mind sphere. Absolutely, and but it also means that whatever sort of the the frame of your the mind sphere you should be in when you have a philosophical discussion like this is potentially different from the mind sphere, the state of your mind sphere, when you're doing some kind of labor that's more repetitive or whatever, like, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but when you're, when you're so someone yeah, else. But, but, but Here's I, what I, yeah. I think that the way to untie this knot, and mm -hmm. oh, and I, but I think we've, we've spoken about this previously, let me know what you think, has to do with the question of formulating the brief or the goal or our telos. So, if the goal is to save the biosphere, and you can make a little footnote here, biosphere as defined as mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a maybe the ecological awareness mode would define it mm -hmm. as the way that the neoliberals define it. If mm -hmm. the goal is to save biosphere, mm -hmm. understood in that way, mm -hmm. and one of the ways is to tackle the mind sphere and understood in this way, through this mode, that might mean uh, you know, fucking Biden and Harris doing promotional campaigns with a lot of actors doing a lot of like fancy shit and mm -hmm. this boomer humanism trying to change mm -hmm. the consciousness of people uh, mm -hmm. and, and educate them to mm -hmm. save the climate. That's one brief. And like, mm -hmm. if the brief is that as an operative of say design or as an agent, as I am, then that's something that I would do. I would just triple the amount of money they're spending and fucking hammer it down people's throats, which is kind of what's happening now with certain other ideologies. Let's not name them. But we mm. could also say that given another brief, mm. uh, another answer might be due. And that's why I always bring up these multiplicities of potential agendas mm -hmm. as mimicking mm -hmm. this, this landscape of medieval Italy. Like some people might want to save the biosphere as if they were boom, boomer humanists and some yep. might be Vladimir Putin and some might be Shell and some might be some people in an island in Gothenburg, uh, uh, you know, funded by the EU. So the yep. conflicting interests in the planetary desiring ecology mm -hmm. makes uh, makes the new sphere into a state of war or like Dugan yep. calls, uh, and I expand it, a new magia, this yep. war of ideas. And it's volatilizing and it's yeah. climate change in that sense has a mirror, which is psychological climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, all these memes are just fucking vibrating much faster. Yeah. And and that and then when we arrive at that point, that's when we can really create good pros like the, the climate imaginaries that actually are informative. Yeah, and, and likely and the ones that you will actually get to sort of choose from because and, and I mean this, and, and then when I say <laughs> climate imaginaries, I mean, you know, both on a sort of, both on a sort of ethical level on like, how are we going to treat one another and nature 10, 100, 1,000 years from now? And how do we now, this feels like a little bit of like a Daniel Schmachtenbergian notion of like thinking on these big time frames from from pretty much a kind of 
a techno social indeed uh, frame of mind like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what are the thoughts and the innovations and the mechanics of whatever we do today that will make the particular ethic that we want and then you really got to think non linearly strategically so that that is is brought about 10 years from now 100,000 but that's the ethical yeah. part and then the that's the aesthetical part and i think something that we underestimate easily is that uh, us three here, we can sit around and talk about ethics because we are, it's may, it's maybe make or break for us. Like, I don't know, depends on how netocratic we are and how everything's going to evolve from there. But I think that there are movers and shakers in this world that are way, 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 way beyond ethics. They are not threatened or or like they they don't really act on that level. They are thinking aesthetics. So there, and I'm pretty sure I haven't covered this, like I haven't gone through this yet, but I think that what we underestimate is the aesthetic kind of aesthetic and ontological struggle between our different elites for framing what, A, what is reality, thus from reality, from the understanding of what reality is, what should the biosphere be like? What should the machine or the biosphere? So like, and I think you will. You have many, many different ontologies and, and aesthetics there. Um, I can name. I can name one, which I think is mm-hmm. so. So, which is very, very sort of hands-on. There is a big struggle over biofuels, right? So, biofuels yeah. is being is being sold as uh, closed loop, certain some closed material loop uh, in terms of both well carbon dioxide, but also it, it's regenerative um and a lot of environmentalists uh have been bought by the by, by some kind of lobby i don't know exactly what lobby but but you know a lot of environmentalists are are pushing for this because it sounds good on some kind of level um uh, it, so it makes partial sense and so forth but then there is a, a completely different camp who would rather say okay but and i'm i really mean it as a, as a camp of sort of big movers and shakers not your everyday uh, ecologist but like no 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 we really, really, really need to save the forests and have them be home to a lot more um, biodiversity. On the other hand, you know, we're going to need electricity. So because we're going to have fewer um, fewer combustion engines, more electricity, so we're going to need nuclear power. So you have the uranium people versus the, the biofuels people, basically, and they're both big-ass evil capitalists, and they just have a different idea of, like... Right where what kind of aesthetic and biodiversity should be housed you know what what should it look like yeah and, I agree. and then you get into risks as well i mean just so what what is your risk perception of, of sort of nuclear catastrophes as opposed to climate catastrophes or or biodiversity collapse it, it, it get it gets kind of technical but it, i think it also is not technical when you get down to it because the 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 attitude of any given mover and shaker in the world billionaire what have you uh, is is going to be some kind of ontological notion? What, what is reality, and what should the planet be like given that reality? Mm. So forth. Let me throw something out that might change the direction slightly. Mm. Like I, I think what we've done has been a fantastic, maybe descriptive ontology of the field as it's looking today. And I'm wondering, within the system that you're developing, Edwin what are the kind of key principles for these movers and change makers that you're trying to reach looking forward? So you, you mean in, in terms of coming back to the teleology of like, yeah, like kind of what is, you could even say the phallus of your project. Mm. So I, um, so, okay. Um, first of all, I, yeah. So the phallus is then, many of the things we've been talking about now have been sort of looking at the field. I, I go towards the end of my work end of my book uh, into a, a concept that I call uh, techno transcendence. Uh, so it's basically nothing new, but, but it's basically, I, I think this is what you guys are so good at and, and why many of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is like, Okay, so we have we know that we're slaves under technology, but the fact that we know that also knows also means that we can maybe alter that a little bit. I don't know, maybe we can even alter it a lot. 
And I, I so so the, the thing is this. I'll I'll take an I'll take an example here. Um, there there are a lot of like efforts around the world. Ca- big capital institutions, companies, financial yada yada fighting for what's the next niche going to be or what's the next niche that's going to die going to be so we can divest from that and all that. So that's basically sustainable development. There are a lot of efforts here going on like to 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 create what's called smart cities. No. Concept of, well, okay, you have a smart integrated city with uh, self-driving cars and like dustbins that fly or whatever. You can order a... A halloumi burger from your toenail chip and or the same it's, fucking yeah. uh song on the background of those youtube videos that are served to promote it which mm-hmm. is like this this delayed <laughs> guitar i'm sorry i just wanted to make a joke there but you know what yeah. i'm talking about right yeah, yeah. Ding, so, ding, 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 ding. so 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 basically and this is so now now i'm gonna be now i'm gonna be an eco-territorial supremacist here because i'm an engineer and i think no, I'm also going to be critical of engineers. Many engineers are stupid because they don't engage with philosophy. But the ones that do, the smart people like me, we need more power and the economists need less. Because what we have now is that economists are all about um, profitability, right? So what's going to be profitable? Oh, we're going to, we're going to do what's profitable. If, if, if the low-hanging fruits is the stupid guitar uh, video uh, smart city thing, that's what you're going to get. Uh, so no, I, that kind of neoliberal like oh nothing it doesn't matter what any aesthetic oh people just pe- pe- people are hedonists they're gonna want what they want no so the the phallic thing here is that uh, we need to think fucking hard on what the what the relationship between humans their technologies and nature is gonna be like and once we have once we have an idea of that like okay it's not a a then b it's gonna be back and forth but that needs to always be part of our our practices rather than low hanging fruits, public private partnership, just sucking our money and, and you know, making our cities stupider. Um, so so the, the phallic thing here is to say, okay, we want a world which is uh, beautiful, uh, sustainable, interesting, where we don't consume ourselves to death, uh, where we don't consume ourselves to, to spiritual death and so forth. So I'm, I'm very critical of, of consumer culture, but I'm also very, very happy with technology. Like I think, we need to be um, thinking like we have we have so much capability of bringing forth higher and higher levels of technical sophistication in the world. Where are we going to do it? Not be it as it may, let it be toenail chips from which you can order your little burger, but rather like what are the interesting things we can do? And then for everything else, can't we just be a little bit more low key, like and get closer to nature, and then be a bit more like pointy and specific rather than just everything being a morass of sort of technological immersion mm. that's that's my <clears throat> end goal here yeah. for whom for whom interesting for whom better for whom well i don't know who these people are that agree with me but i i i think that uh, there's going to be a substantial amount of people who do I, I don't know exactly who it is like for who, I have, this is a loaded question because l- let me yeah. maybe try to inform it a little yeah. bit yeah. <clears throat> um, for whom uh, uh, um, for those who can because it's mm-hmm. gonna, here, here's my perspective climate change is going to see a if there has been a an, an expanding tree with many people in different sides of the world, doing their lives in different ways. With climate change, there there will be a pruning of that tree, whether we like it or not. Now, we may try to keep that pruning to a minimum. We might want to continue Mm -hmm. our status quo and make sure that all these branches Mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. I think that by the nature of things, with or without climate change, but climate change intensifies, that there are those who will adapt and those who will not. That's Mm -hmm. history. We've had 200 years of everybody wins, or at least it seems to us because we're, we're in Europe. But we have, you know, last 30 years, the ideology is everybody wins. Mm-hmm. I would say maybe that's, that's not going to be the case in the future. And so when I ask mm, for whom, yeah. for whom yeah. do these interesting things uh, serve, my question is like, um, maybe yeah, for I, those who can. This is the fucking scary point, right? Yeah, this is the scary point. But, but I was thinking, You're not going to live forever anyway. No, exactly. And, and I, it's, it, on some level, it's like I would like the intellectually and spiritually most 
I don't know what I should say. Like, I don't want to say evolved, but like, I, I, I think bubble capable. But that because that's not really how I how I conceive of this. I, I can bring in another point, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a tough one. But but I would say that my. I, I, I'm not really interested in, but of course, so for whom it's good. There's going to be some winners and losers here, uh, correlated to you know the the internal structure of a human individual and their capacity to to agree with me or anyone who has um, ideas that are on the same playing field of mine, but maybe opposite. Like, so are you a player here or not? But but I would say that like I'm I'm interested in the capabilities of the capability for for this is maybe kind of a scientist notion but like the capability for life on earth to meta understand itself and mm -hmm. climate change because it has the potential to not only kill brilliant people uh but also uh kind of le levy us into a more totalitarian police state world that's a problem for what I want to achieve. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think I want to save, um, kind of, or be save some kind of the, 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 the trajectory that's, um, trying to sort of manifest the highest possible, levels of understanding of what what this is yeah um, I, I, I and, that, and that's going to be look very different like that's going to look look different 50 years from now that's going to look diff very different Twenty thousand years from now but I, I i just think that whatever we can do today to make that more possible i don't give a hoot who's there to do it like but mm -hmm. by its very nature it's kind of tautological like the people who we're going to do it are those that can do it, but I think we can be smarter or stupider today in order to, to sort of make that. And, and there's a question of like how big or small that sample is. Like I, I, I guess I admit like I'm a bit of a Marxist at heart, but in the sense that I like people doing yeah. things yeah. as an aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. Like the more people there are actively gay engaged in the act of creation in the mm -hmm. world, for me, that is kind of a fundamental baseline for a better world. And yes, there's probably an element of that being the principle I choose <laughs> to to negate the void. But that is what I go with. Okay. And so it's ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of doing technology that enable that, that activity and that agency of people, but without it being being caught up in the, the the enlightenment humanism kind of notion mm -hmm. of everybody's a player and everybody takes part and everybody's going to be this. Like, I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot recently since actually reading the dialectic of enlightenment by Adorno and Holkheimer, for example, like what they do very well is lay out the flaw with this idea of using rationality to make a better world. Because the, well, the kind of way they invert it is that if you're like, if your rubric is we're going to use rationality to improve the human condition, then anything that appears to improve the human condition shows up, flags as rational. And so you can end up legitimizing all sorts of totalitarian institutions just by the sense of, oh, it's making human life better. I think you can do the same thing for just this notion of treating people equally as humans. Like kind of implicit in that is this sense of, making people implicit making people equally human and I, whatever yeah. makes people equally human is a good mm -hmm. ideology or a good ideology that itself i want to break away from i like i'm not interested in making people equally human i'm kind of more interested in making people equally unhuman in a uh -huh. okay wow <laughs> now that's interesting but but yeah okay so that, that save the last one but i i just sort of two, two things there I think that precisely because a state of where everybody is, because you, you also kind of distinguish between treating everybody equally human and everybody being like, yeah. So that's the difference between opportunities and outcomes. Right. So yeah, I, I, of course we should strive for, or it's not, of course, people don't agree, but I think we should strive for the equality of opportunity and definitely not of outcome. That's going to be horrible. For many reasons, that's a whole other uh, episode. People have spoken more eloquently than I ever could about it anyway. But 
But like, yeah, so that for me is also a given that's kind of placed in my heart, but that all the more reason not to be polarized on this kind of issue. Like you're a bad person for la la la. No, wait, uh, the person who says that, have you even understood all of the ramifications of ecology and politics surrounding it? I don't think you have. So and they won't. Who moralize like <clears throat> friendship, like so. And, but then the Adorno Horkheimer angle. I just want to get like I, I I'm pretty sure. Like I don't know them that well. Uh, maybe they were not disingenuous, but I think a lot of their sort of subsequent uh, fanboys are in that. So you said rationality. Let me just reframe it as instrumentalism. Like mm. you have this, this um, um, postmodern idea of the of Western enlightenment as being problematic because it's in, instrumentalist. But if you look at academia today or many other places, what is being instrumentalized is POMO. So, I mean, come on. Oh, yeah, this is you, the fucking yeah. problem. With This is why, the, in the same way that the Nazis butchered Nietzsche, everybody who's come <laughs> off yeah. the Fair enough. Fair have butchered enough. them. Yeah. By mis- they've been using exactly yeah. the instrumental centralized institutions that the guys mm-hmm. aim, aim to critique. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fu- you fucked it, guys. <laughs> yeah. And so, I feel like I, I want to come back to that point that I made a while ago. I know I misappropriated one of your points, Edwin, about. Uh, territorialist supremacy, mm. but it feels like uh, I, I, I come back to this point and I'm where, while everybody is a self-interested player trying to get their own across, sometimes that implies uh, attaining the means of truth production that is influencing everybody to act morally finger wagging is one strategy another one is like uh, broadening people's consciousnesses and shit and creating like exhibits and biennales and shit but at the end of the day everybody is a player trying to advance their own cause Mm. the circumstances and i'm being purely sort of pragmatic here the circumstances Mm. uh are climate change and and the fucking environmental collapse and like the stack of crisis that is on top of that which is not going to be interesting and so when I that is why the question of for whom are are we actually thinking about this instrument? Because what you're doing is thinking about an instrument for thought for power, and that is the part that I like the most. Like, hey, here's a beautiful car with which mm-hmm. you can ride this fucking bitch mm-hmm. up. But uh, my my what I, what I want to throw is that is a little bit like going like how many. What what's the the size of the sample of the people that are going to be able to navigate, survive, make the most out of this? It's going to be twenty billionaires, and everybody else is dead. Or is it going to be small pockets of netocratic elites who are communist on the inside, and then the outside is just consuming, consuming, consuming until they kill themselves out? You know, and and, well, and I, I see what that you may mean. be. That may be. It's going to be sort of a variation of of these scenarios. Like one scenario yeah. is everybody survives and is happy. Yeah. The other one is just just a few survive. However, regardless of the scenario, mm-hmm. the the, imper- the 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 differentiating factor is going to make a difference at the bottom line. Is going to be the ability of the few leaders who have the ability to produce truth and those means to make smart decisions for their own little group and adapt and thrive. And that little group may be everybody. That little group may be 20 billionaires in a, in a basement in New Zealand in the bunker. Uh, <laughs> and that I don't know. And that I don't know. But no. what's lacking in either case, what's lacking in either case is what you're working with for yeah, towards, maybe. which is the, the car, the, the tech, yeah. power technology, the, the precise understanding. And I don't think people have precise understandings because they're very ideologically mot- uh, motivated yeah. and blinded. And it's a very hard problem to crack naturally. Yeah. So that's why. I, and I, I want to add something to that. Story, yeah. but throw it to you. I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we align uh, on this, of course, but but I, I think that... Um, so where was I? I, I yeah, okay. So mm, netocracy, um, I think that um, th- there's going to be an interplay between 
yeah, there will be netocratic clusters, and there 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 will be some that have an inclination towards sort of bread and circuses, kind of wanting to have gladiator games, wherein you of course need consumptarians in to be the gladiators, but also to sort of uphold an, a, a high enough sort of le- level of quasi-slave-driven standard of living such that you can live like that. But I think there will be really powerful other netocratic that are, you know, not sort of banal Marxist in a banal sense of like save everyone, but but like give everyone a fishing rod kind of thing, like put like kind of uh, what was the movie called uh they they live with the glasses and all that like you you know the, the okay yes, yes, maybe, yes, yes. maybe listeners don't know but okay there's this movie uh, from the 80s and guy uh working class guys uh living in a kind of fictitious new york town and finds special special made uh, uh sunglasses and all, all of a sudden you can see the ideological sort of backbone behind every shit going on in consumer society and I think there are going to be loads of netocrats who want to distribute sunglasses to everyone in a state like that. And and, I, and I'm definitely one of them. And I, I think that, you know, kind of what I want to do is to say, um, if you want to be like the cats out of the bag kind of thing, like exposing everyone, ev- everybody's exposed to the thought patterns of everyone else. That means that by some kind of hope, maybe I'm being... It's kind of romantic here, but by, by by some kind of effort where democracy or like wills of informed people coexists with the technological development, it's going to be hard to be a fully Machiavellian actor, let's say. So, yeah, there will be competence hierarchies and the like, but like... If if you if people can smell that what you want is sort of power grab for the wrong reasons, if you want to be a illegitimate authority, people are. This is only part of it, but but you see what I'm getting at. Like, yeah, yeah, make yeah. It easier yeah. for people say, to smell yeah. that. Basically. It's going to be like a new geopolitics. It's going to be, uh, it's be a, a netocratic clusters. Like, yeah, I think that whether or not there will be an informed democratic large group of people living safe lives is going to be a secondary preoccupation, a byproduct of whether or not some people can solve this issue or not. Because it's not a matter of wanting to oppress or wanting to rule for the wrong reasons. It's just, can you do it or can you not do it? So the ultimate, it's, it's yeah. the, the metric is, is yeah. can you do it or can you not? Yeah. It, it's not, Oh, I can do it, and I'm going to keep it all for myself. You can't really do that. Or, no, I agree. So, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The great yeah. thing that I'm that I'm hinging on is like, if anyone manages to solve or survive this problem, mm-hmm. that's number one preoccupation. Everything else comes mm. downstream from that. Whether how society organizes after that is comes after that, I guess. And and uh, yeah, it's good. Sadly. Now you actually you you actually corrected a thing, but which I, I completely agree that it's not the case that this planetary desire, ecological power grab thing, it's not primarily driven by some kind of uh, Faustian thing imaging. It's yeah. more a, a kind of clipothic fear, like I'm so afraid. I, I have I, I still have this stone age caveman inside of me and i'm so afraid that that if i don't accumulate enough social status power and resources i'm gonna die tomorrow you know and it's just on autopilot and and that i I think that kind of thing is is far more um you know pervasive and prevalent than than the sort of um you know oh um orchestration of of uh but 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 no but the end Result could be the same if I if whatever I said makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. The tribe is is in a cave. There's another tribe coming to invade, and the whole fucking survival of the tribe depends on whether or not that one dude is able to wake up. Mm-hmm. He is able to get everyone to move, and he's mm-hmm. able to direct the way. And then when he gets there, if people survive. If people die on the way, who the fuck knows? Mm. But it hinges on that one, dude. Yeah. Uh, in other words, 
and then like to take that metaphor to 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 mm. kind of a, a, a maybe a more mature state of human affairs once these tribes have semi merged mm. uh the fact that there's so much disparity in what people think about ecology for instance they might have right, different ecological right, right, practices right, right. how are we going to navigate that so that's basically where we're where we are we're just on a global scale now whereas you would have two tribes meet in the indus valley like where we are doing cattle ranching this way we're doing cattle ranching this way oh no the, now it's on you know it's it's yeah, going to be yeah. if they're civilized it's going to be debates and it's probably always been a mix of sort of debates uh how to win friends and influence people and violence and like that's where we're at now how are we going to navigate this space now we're not you know we're cattle ranching on the planet but so there cattle, won't be yeah. there won't be a consensus globally no never um yeah never. so that's that's kind of my point like yeah. within the landscape of conflict between all the tribes mm-hmm. there will be those who do not make the cut in in every sense of, of the word metaphorical and maybe literal and i'm not saying this gladly obviously but it feels to me like that's the rule of history yeah of course by the way and by the way we will also die so we should be pragmatic about you know oh we would love everybody to live and survive and have a good life yeah but, but we're not going to live forever anyway, no so. no exactly and and, and like, like i can invoke the the concept of immune system here like we all have very different immune systems on a biological level and on a mental level so yeah. we're sitting here today because maybe partially because our ancestors had better immune systems uh, to to the black plague but there could be uh, pandemics coming around the next corner right. where we are very exposed due to the, our genetic makeup. And the same thing goes for, for the mental sphere because, and that's where, for instance, like, okay, uh, Chomsky calls it uh, intellectual self-defense. So that's also what my book is. It's intellectual self-defense. It's kind very of a good. vaccine. It's a, it's a vaccine. It's a mental very vaccine. Good. So, uh, yeah. And and yes, every, people, are gonna die. Cool. people are always going to die. The, the, mo- the people with the best immune system are going to survive, whether it's mental or not. And like, very I just cool. want to give, I just have a vaccine. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Very I'm cool. a candidate. Yeah. <laughs> very yeah. cool. Very cool. That That's yeah. very, that's very cool. Mm. Uh, clarifying as well. Reminds me of the concept of speciation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is what I love about your taxonomy of the different stances of relationship between consciousness and environment. It's like it feels like a really good initial way to just be like, okay, like we're this tribe and then that tribe. In the same way that like we're the West and that's China. Mm-hmm. What are the particular aesthetics, ethics that are underlying? their decision makings and how they do business. It's very functional, isn't it? How do they try? Yes. And then how can we thus do environmental diplomacy based upon Mm. this? Exactly. How do you do this verb? I love that. Yeah, because it's going to be that, like this fantasy of getting all the nations in the world to sign the agreement that we're all going to get our carbon down by this year and then... Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everyone says we're going to do it, and then nobody's going to do it, and everyone no, and, it five and years that, into the future. Yeah, <laughs> and they Ooh. sit around the table, and all they do is dither about who gets to emit what in relation to who gets a part of what part of a piece of growth pie. Basically, it's so banal. It's that they're not digging into what we're doing at all like psychologically why are we doing what we're doing and what is it exactly no no it's completely like reduced in that in the case of climate to you know this kind of back and, and, and forth yeah and they like, won't to like the power struggles like i was just in prep for this interview listening to an interview with uh bjorn lomborg do you know the guy mm-hmm. the Danish? Yeah, yeah i know yes yeah of course yeah yeah uh with brendan o'neill and one of the points he was making so one of the things the eu is doing is basically only or saying i think if i've got this right that basically you can have some of our development money, but only if you have your agreement to get your carbon down to this level by this point. And it's like, that sounds all well and good, but it's basically just strong arming. And all it takes is for China to come in underneath and go, hey there, Bangladesh, like actually yeah. you keep doing what you're doing. We have the money. I, like, I just want to say it's in, it's really interesting because I, I, I have the same kind of distaste for this kind of top-downism. On the other hand, I just want to say for the record, the, the problem with Bjorn Lomborg is he's one of these people who's really a, a fan favorite among certain people who couldn't care less about the environment and, and care about other stuff. And he's, 
I, I don't I don't like him. Uh, I, I think he's uh, he is the epitome of he's so much a neoliberal sustainable development guy that he goes completely overboard. I mean, you have so he'll have competitors who are also neoliberal sustainable sustainable development guys, but they just want to price carbon 10 times higher than him. That's the only reason. And I, I think they um, maybe they're both going about it the wrong way. Um, but on top of that, he's also a nihilist in a way. Like he's, he, uh, you, you like, okay, now I'm, this is good. I'm going to critique John Lombard. He, he had an interview with, with um, Princeton, the guy who's a Hoover institution, uh, Peter Robinson. I think he's, he interviews all, all, a lot of mm-hmm. interesting people. And he was pushed on all these, oh, what are the climate effects of this and that? And he said, well, so um, it's been proven. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll grant. It's been proven scientifically that both with rising temperatures and uh, rising carbon dioxide concentrations as such, not as in the greenhouse gas, but the way you're breathing it, basically, it's proven that that uh, lowers cognitive capacity. Higher temperatures and higher carbon lowers, but we'll solve that with better ventilation. And I'm like, I want to be smart outdoors as well. I, this is this is complete <laughs> like neoliberal. Like, oh, but you, what are you, what do you want to? Oh, but you, you'll do, you'll still do your paycheck to paycheck nine to five job inside of a building, and with all the wonderful technology that our neoliberal ideology is going to bring forth. Oh, you'll do that in, in wonderfully ventilated. I'm like, hell no. That's not aesthetic to me at all. That's not sexy at all. You're a fucking idiot. It's like, yeah, he's he's so doing the job of, of yeah, he doing the job of these people who who can yeah. afford the best ventilation in the most yeah, pleasant yeah. of places. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Nah. I'm not a I'm not a fan of him. Although yeah, I'll grant him, of course. Uh, I think there is there is a big problem with this kind of uh, blackmailing. That you mentioned, like yeah, that, and that, and if we go about this in a more sort of philosophically grounded way, we will, I hope, I think, not need that kind of blackmail. Uh, that's what I do. What I do, but yeah. That's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you could influence a group of people now out in the world today, or bring them your views and try to influence an intervention, who would they be, and why? Um, if you've thought about that, okay. Yeah, the, I, I, so there's a, there's kind of a dream scenario mm-hmm. answer to that question and the realist one. I'm, okay, I'm going to write and I'm writing what I do in a way which sort of it's it's going to be inaccessible in some way. So, and I think that the only people who will be at heart influenced by what I do will be the ones who understand it word for word. Like, and they maybe will do some kind of strategic, they'll be in turn like, Oh, uh, maybe they work in whichever place or maybe they do whatever, but, but like, okay, I could boil this down to some kind of talking points and give it to my boss or my local politician or whatever. But that's always going to be like, there's a filter there that's going to just kill it. So I, I, on a realistic level, I think, I don't know who they are, but they are probably uh, as interested as I am in the interaction between and you guys. I mean, you 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 grasp all of this, so it's it's no. I I know sort of intuitively who my uh, target audience is, but if I were to dream, then of course I would hope that the people who do climate negotiations, that the people who sit around. Uh, the tables when different national strategies for for energy and growth is being discussed um Mm -hmm. i think uh, i don't know it's uh, um i haven't really thought about it i guess i should but it's it's more like uh the chips will will land where they may yeah 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 that's fair yeah that's fair. You're at the point of channeling from the gods, and once it comes down, it will do its effects and extend yeah. its tendrils out there, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, yeah, and there are some unknown unknowns, like some. I love I that, dude. Who, you did yeah. not just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I love to quote uh, who was it? Colin Powell, Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld, he, yeah. He's my favorite guy to quote <laughs> when it's like, we got the unknown and known. So I'm like, <laughs> fucking like rhetorical yeah. brilliance. 
Hey, it, it is that and sentence course, alone was worth millions. I, I'll... And of course, Slavoj Žižek completed his system by saying, not only do you have uh, known unknowns, but you have unknown knowns. That's the fourth quadrant that he didn't that he didn't say. So it is, it is. Like, of course, yeah. Žižek has your prejudices or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Žižek has a has a doctoral degree on cool fucking mental twists. E- exactly. Uh, yeah. He what said you... he said the three and that there's a fourth. That there's <laughs> yeah. a hidden one. Yeah. And he always like he'll he'll start he'll start a lot like a tenth of all his sentences he'll say like what is the situation it's the opposite like <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's an incredible exactly. impression and yeah. what does that show you that he's the rock star he consumes yeah. latent intellectual capital and twists it yeah. he's about the yes this but this and he's the but this like it's so so good so good yeah, and also like not only. This is this is completely like uh, we have a parallel stream here, which is actually correct. But going in the opposite direction from what everybody else is doing, that's probably right. Like, what if the opposite is true? It's For like, someone who operates monetizing the flow of information, that's very useful because he's going around telling people things that they didn't know. As mm-hmm. such, the magic wizardry of his of his shtick and of his spiel have uh, denote that it is obvious that it begins yes you think this but also <laughs> yeah. now this i yeah. must he's like a little guy with like a hat and he pulls rabbits out of it and you, you think there's no rabbits yeah. but actually but but uh, i i do improv theater right so that's exactly ah. improv theater yes and that's that's the shtick that's love the spiel it, you know it, yes it. and okay that's and he's the we... rock star of yes and because his yeah. yes and he is, is like Negative and quirky <laughs> and fun. Yeah, I love it. Improv theater. I would love to do that, by the way. Yeah. And this is a complete, a complete side uh, step from, from where our conversation was heading. Let me tell you, us uh, just maybe a thing that your 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 points inspired on me. Um, I hope it's not too loud. There's a plane going by. By the way, there's like a, actually F-16s usually going by my window regularly because this is close to Russia, so NATO. Uh, when you speak about these these, these modalities of uh, relating, this mm. relatedness, it feels to me like they're not only functions of, uh, they're functions of the human being as much as they're functions of the relation and then functions of the ideology through which we relate to the environment. If we grant that the environment is this immutable thing. In other words, each modality will reveal only a portion of the problem of the environment. Each modality will trigger only a bit, a portion of the libidinal machinery of the human. So Mm -hmm. the territorial supremacist is an egotist with power trips, whereas Mm -hmm. the environmental uh, uh, awareness person is someone who's had it nice all his life and he wants it to be nice and not to really just to keep it safe, please. So these different attitudes satisfy different psychosocial, psychosomatic strategies. They mediate different payoffs. In other words, people are self-interested when they pick one of these, <clears throat> which is something that comes into play when, it, when I make my more Machiavellian conflict-based analysis. So, And so what comes to mind to me is that these... I, I don't want to call them ontological modalities, but almost, and maybe they are even. Yeah, because they they strike deep. They are mode of relation uh-huh. uh, towards this very important problem. Uh, well, exactly, I that, and it's not yeah. only. I just want to emphasize, like it's it's not only towards uh, a a or the problem, but it's also a relation to everything which is neutral or possibility or positive as well like it's the relation of, and how other people yeah. position themselves in relation to the problem yeah because oh, as yeah. we've seen yeah, 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 there are yeah. a few people yeah. who position themselves in relation to a problem namely the environment under oh, yeah. the lights of another problem uh patriarchy the guys in gothenburg as such yeah. it is yeah purely 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 about psychosocial revenue indeed and, and like it's just about like at- getting that payoff and bitching against this or that and yeah, and try that, basic like in group, out group, uh, cohesion, yada yada. Like, and and like, just look at um, 
this this split between what I call ecological consciousness and ecological awareness, you see it again and again. And of course, yeah, you see it in ecology and it takes all sorts of interesting shapes there. But you also see it in like hippies versus punk rockers. It's basically the wishy-washy people versus the hardcore blacksmith materialist people. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing, but on a different level. And Mm -hmm. it's all about, you know, creating whereas maybe so. So like we're all... um, Countercultural, subcultural, we all hate the man, but we hate the man in so different ways that we, you know, the revolution eats its own children and whatever. Like, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe two things here. One of them is the, 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 when I say psychosocial revenue, I'm talking about how uh, the strategy that some people adopt when relating regarding this problem is not um, genuine or is not, is more concerned with the payoff that they will get then with the resolution of the problem. I think that goes without saying. Mm. Secondly, there's someone, it's very trendy. It's about, it's about what's, what's cool at the moment. Like there, there will be things that will be cool at certain moments. And there's a certain subset of the population, especially those who tend to perhaps be more sutric and follow uh, that will adopt the strategy that is in vogue at the moment, sold by the merchants of cool who Mm -hmm. have agreements with whoever pays them more. Mm. And uh, the, End goals of those who are able to pay more are the ones who will imperate or rule over the minds of those who just follow. And that's just how it is. Because <laughs> another thing that I need to say is that within the the, the plethora, like these six modes of, of acting, mm-hmm. there's an inner circle and outer circle. There's a message for those within who can yep. not only understand it, but those who can also put it into effect, which is a minority of a minority of a minority. And there is also a message that needs to be translated and digested for the outside, which is generally speaking, quite stale and fulfills a psychosocial uh, function of helping them sleep better at night during the 20 minutes that they have to consider these these issues because sadly, they're concerned with many other things, namely survival. Yeah, I mean, you you always get this this paradox of tolerance as well, like all of these different modalities within them. Yeah, there will be different communicative practices, and there'll be a lot of dog whistling. Like, so uh, even I mean, yeah, you you could go even as far as to say that if you adopt a, a, a woke enough ideology, then you're allowed to be overtly or covertly racist. Not only racist in the in the CRT sense, but also like, because we're all now, you know, gathered around, you know, we've gathered somewhere in like uh, uh, Schmonktenburg, Massachusetts, where it's only white people and we care so much about the environment. And it's all a little bit like, yeah, we like each other because we're so culturally similar, like that kind of dog whistle, but also on the like with these kind of racial or, or sort of the guardian. Yeah, and the, these overtones notwithstanding, like even like so, you know, the, the basic fact of saying, oh, tolerance for difference is so important. And yet, if you want to be part of our clique, then, you know, you better you better fall in line, buddy. Like so that, that, and that's a that's a paradox that's always going to be. But, but I, I, I just want to get back to because you were speaking of these modalities and like psychosocial things. Yeah, the below, you that, get yeah from there, there are there are there are those, and and you you had this episode where you talked about that was more sort of on the on the sort of broader political, not only ecological kind of left right divide the way it looks right now. With rather, it's been more sort of material before, and now it's becoming increasingly like Freudian. Like if you have uh, mommy or daddy issues, you you right. tend to have one or the other. Like it's so fascinating, and I think that plays a big part here in what you are you a person who's scared of the phallic or are you a person who's scared of the kind of the, the womb inclusiveness or I don't know, say yeah, yeah. of course it does of course it does yeah. and said that there's three ways that this fucking thing can play out one which is not going to work <clears throat> is to try to take all of everybody's complexes and inclinations and perhaps biases and try to resolve them in a way that works well for everyone. That's the guardian pipe dream, the truth with those priests sell while they're protecting their own self-interest, which is not going to happen because history is a fall. It's never a stasis. It's a movement. Precisely our complexes and our traumas are the, sub, the, the 
informs our lived experience. They are the substance of history. So mm-hmm. scenario one, resolution of all conflicts will not will not happen. And so in a world where there are plenty of conflicts, political and otherwise, that inform also this most important of questions. People can either forfeit the playing the game altogether and, and you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I'll just pick one that serves me more or less the best and let someone else do the thinking or the third one, which is purely and radically. And in my, in, in my opinion, more truthfully and more pragmatically and effectively consider that this is just a game of effectiveness and power that every fucking spiel is a power strategy. Mm-hmm. Then that's Okay. Mm-hmm. most people think that's not okay mm-hmm. because they want to resolve everything no no it's okay it's what it is let's be pragmatic mm-hmm. here at least between those who are in this podcast and, and listening as well like being pragmatic we need to understand that every act is a power act involved in the power economy we're all more or less uh, self-interested players interested in ourselves and the well-being of our own tribe mm-hmm. and obviously of everyone else but the everyone else is so far away and so hard to conceptualize because of our dumbbar sized brains that in that little interval between 150 and a billions lies the politics, lies the other. It's the white man. It's China who's burning loads of coal. It's BP. It's mm-hmm. the Russians. Mm-hmm. It's the fucking woke people in Gothenburg. So, you know, mm-hmm. these power games, what's the resolution yeah. from within these power games? I would, I will say that the winner will be someone who will admit that it is what it is. Yeah. Like, I, I think you can't omit the aesthetic. <laughs> there's the power, but there's also the orientation towards the transcendent. Like yeah. maybe that is the way that power manifests itself by positing some beautiful ideal. But I think it's a mistake to go full Machiavelli and go. Oh, but they align. But they, they, align. they do. They do align. It's like the Jews in Israel. Like if you're good, God will bless you. If you're effective, yeah. God will bless you. If 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 you don't pray Which to God properly, also can become tautological, incidentally. But but yeah, but but, but I think reciprocal feedback yeah, yeah, into it itself. Is, but, but, yeah, uh, but but yeah, and and that's a good thing, right? But I, I just want I think yes. So it is oriented towards the transcendental, yeah, and that's that's something we need to be talking more about. I would say that the kind of game B kind of individuals toying with and kind of common recognition of okay we're having a purely like i'm sitting here in my apartment i'm sort of middle class guy i don't necessarily want to have a better life materially i just want to get more wise and it's, maybe we share have that in common i don't know but like more wives uh, what more wives <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry that's what i heard that going no 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 yeah okay okay well um you'll have to do some editing where you know, but, but I, I, I'm just like thinking, okay, so what is, so game B for those who don't know, it's like this yeah, big mashup of people trying to sort of be pragmatic in the way you described. So problems, yada, yada, we're not individuals, we're not going to take individual credit. We're individuals. We attempt to understand when we're in the room with a person who is more uh, well-read or, or more intelligent in some kind of domain than I am, then that person will be my leader for the next 30 seconds then maybe the conversation will will shift and so that kind of giving and taking which incidentally is also is attentionalism is int- exactly and, and and which is very sort of improv theater as well i think that but the the, the risk that runs is that being too materialist like okay but the, the things that are easy to talk about is like how are we going to build this reactor and how are we going to safeguard this rainforest now we get that's all well and good okay but like, yeah, yeah we yeah, need yeah. that but for the orientation towards the transcendent. i agree like, i agree 100 yeah 100 yeah. yeah. but 100 percent. now i get what you were what you and owner are trying to get to and you're right um if if it came across that I was just focusing on the materialistic, then then by no means, the because it's also the attitude, it is also the belief system that enables that. No, you weren't. I'm just saying. The what what I what came to my mind was this sort of game B thing, mm, which okay. I which and, and I'm pretty sure, but like which mm. I enjoy, but then I I see the the potential for that to be just another kind of the next iteration of a sort of autistic uh yeah. ra- over rationalized thing where like nick bostrom is the king or everything and i don't want that so yeah uh, <laughs> yeah two things yeah. one whenever i hear the term dialogos i cringe second um 
it is indeed one of those situations where uh, when you have a bunch of people coalescing and organizing this freedom to quote Bjork, organizing the freedom of thought that we have, and which is something very Scandinavian, and then clustering <laughs> it around a specific um, route, we need to account for the fact that it's good, there's going to be a guy, there's going to be a guy, even for just for the sake of being an asshole, who will say, I will not comply. Um, and that's yeah, and I mean, a reminder. That, that, of, of exactly. Confidence. And it's going to be very hard to tell when that is assholery and when it's doing as, uh, the Hamletian thing of the play is the thing in which we'll catch the conscience of the king. Like now I'm putting on a show where I'm giving a kind of resistance, which is not really part of, uh, of, of the way we do things around here. But that's going to expose the really juicy stuff, you know. So, yeah. Uh -huh. and the, yeah. Mm. Wow. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that that enters the realm of the tactical. And within the tactical, yeah. I feel I can talk truthfully to people. Yeah. Because uh, within the realm of the ideal and of the let's convince and let's establish I, sometimes. Yeah, we something. need to talk a lot more, maybe another time, but uh, the, the differences between the strategic and the tactical in, in this kind of, mm -hmm. well, yeah, in this context, ecological context, but also because now we've rolled into different other spheres. Because I think it's yeah. very, very succinct of you to say that that, that is, that the Hamletian play is indeed tactical and not strategic. It's a very important point. Um yeah. It is, it is. It's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. I love it. The play within the play as tactic. <clears throat> I love it. There's a point that Nietzsche makes, right, about the importance of knowing how to have enemies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Indeed. It's like getting your friend who's in the front row of a talk that you give to ask you precisely the question you give him beforehand so that you can, <laughs> and you'll create that little conflict that is obviously prescribed so that you can then shine or roll in your stuff. It's controlled opposition is ag agent provocateurs is a game book of insurrection management that has been written for decades now. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's mythopoetic, right? It's, it's, I can't remember what the name is of the phenomena where not photobomb, but like people would gather all in the same place and uh, like, Hundred people with an umbrella in a tube in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Flash mobbing. Flash mobbing. Yeah, flash, flash mob. mobbing. That's the one. Like everything that can be flash mobicized should be kind of because, you know, like, if I'm sitting, the, the thing you just described, the, the guy who's giving his doctorate disputation, uh, uh, whatever you call it, uh, lecture, if he has actually put a, a mythopoetic flash mob into that, uh, am I going to remember his? take-home messages more of course i am so if his take-home messages are valuable to me uh i'm gonna be grateful that he actually made it into a spectacle rather than just you know giving me the sort of linear stream of whatever jim jones the the, the, the leader of the cult of the people's <laughs> temple also gave his subjects a mythopoetical framing to the <laughs> subject which was in many ways about racial equality and liberation in the yeah. united states about so, Christianity, but transforming Christianity into Marxism, into socialism, into making people equal. He got so far as to say, if you're born in America, you're born in sin, you're born in capitalism, you're born in fascism, you're born in racism, which rings very mm -hmm. interesting and, and, and reminiscent of many things you hear today. And he said that, and yet he killed his people. So, you know, utility, whenever I hear the term utility, whenever I hear mm -hmm. the term good, whenever mm -hmm. I hear the term mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. I, pull, I pull up my, my cynical hat, uh, and be like, oh, okay. Uh, that's yeah. why I believe that it's important to agree on a brief in the beginning, even if, and I'm accepting in that in that edge, right, on that front. If the brief is, let's, it can be very small and very humble in its purposes, but at least let's agree on what we want, and let let's not use large notions that are vague around good or around truth, or around better, or around more beautiful, or more useful. Because those is where the confusion lies. But if we are specific, so instead of saying, in behavioral design, there's a thing. You can tell someone, you can try to design to try to improve someone's uh, dental hygiene, but you don't design 
to improve dental hygiene. That's too vague of a goal. But you can totally say, after you brush your teeth, you floss and you can imprint that specific habit. And if that's mm-hmm. the mission, you, I can do that mission. It's concrete enough. So the more granular, the more concrete and something is formulated, then the more effective it is. But if our, we are talking about good and valor and the search and how to justify that, some heads have to roll because some fucking psychopath climbs to the top of his dominance hierarchy because he fucking smells the blood and he smells the space and smells everyone else's indecision, mm. then they will because that space does not emerge when there's a clear cut granular so, definition of the brief. Yeah, and I mean, you're, you're, you're hitting on something here. I think obviously there's been a surge of virtue signaling since forever, but it's been amplified by recent postmodern whatever. And I think if, speaking of telos and everything, like if we can, if we can imprint kind of plant the seeds of a culture where radical descriptiveness rather than whatever is the alternative <coughs> is that which grants you a, a fucking modicum of virtue, which lasts for five seconds, by the way. So it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, the I military do that, that, don't they? The, mili- the military do that. Yeah, they do that. It's so, truthful testimony. Yeah. It's not, yeah. oh, I saw something that felt were wrong. No, mm-hmm. no. At, mm-hmm. at 1,100 hours mm-hmm. in this place, this mm-hmm. direction, I found this fucking thing. And you tell it to this guy and he'll yeah. tell to the other guy. So yeah, that's an example. Yeah, good one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and and there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with that. I mean, so... Um, and then, of yeah. course, I will say there are problems with militaristic thought if... But then, then that has nothing to do with the degree to which you're going to be sort of tactical in that sense, but rather like if the mili- militarism means that you no longer, as Owen so so uh, like nicely put it, orientation towards the transcendental. Again, like if your fucking boots on the ground attitude is going to come in the way of that, then you're in trouble. Like so, but but yeah, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. In the early 19th century, they correlated Jeremy Bentham when there was people living in slums in London to work in the factories mm. with the 19 with the um, Industrial Revolution. He came in and he was supposed to organize the whole the whole thing. And for a certain moment, the um, hygiene was correlated with morality. If you were diseased and if you died of a disease that you obviously obviously caught because you lived in filth. Then that was also because of morality, because clean people are moral and you're only dirty if you're immoral and thus the disease is deserved. And wealth is good if you're wealthy, then you must have done good. Poverty is uh, is being immoral. And so there was this climate Mm-hmm. which had to do with uh, with trying to achieve a purpose, which was the hygienization and the organization of the society in London to make it better, like creating sewage, you know, making sure mm-hmm. that all these people survive uh, without too many diseases. And I find that that rhymes with what we're seeing today, with trying to make a, a, a proper thought, hygienic thought, a moral issue. Uh mm-hmm. Well, well, take the vaccine. Yeah, and, and like, could, sorry, go ahead. Mm, that 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 uh, there's a corollary in that in right thinking as purported by mainstream reality. That's point number two, and, and mm-hmm. we can see the mirror in that. That's why you know Facebook feels entitled to tell you maybe you're seeing extremist content. Yeah. That's immoral. You shouldn't do that. Be hygienic. Contribute to better public order. When I hear public order, I think Bentham, I think these practices, it's Foucault through and through. But the third point about that that I wanted to make is that this feeds into environmentalism and that you know nihilist or Nietzschean environmentalism is going to be a thing to combat that, <laughs> uh, whereas you have this moralizing environmentalism that is, that is not yours, but each of the modalities that you purported, some of them purport this, this moralization is like, mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm. you don't eat vegan chocolate and you eat meat. You mm-hmm. are a bad person. Mm-hmm, in the same mm-hmm. way that if you were in the 19th century, you didn't shower, you were immoral. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, and there are pragmatic purposes for this. Number one, public order, because 
the environmentalism, let's face it, it's public order. It's humanity managing its own shtick. Because mm-hmm. if we die, the planet comes back that season. So it's it's sure. really about us managing it. Yeah. Uh, so again, public order. Again, uh, uh, that sort of utilitarian point of view, the most good for the most people. And so whenever it gets whenever it gets to this point that is a little bit more moralizing, I'm, I'm more, huh, how else can we think about this? And how else can, can effectiveness be, be played in here? And to what extent is this yet another push for technologies of control over the, the many, which well, it also I, is? And that's a tremendous opportunity of business for mm. the few. Well, I'm, I'm going to sound like some kind of uh, Protestant preacher way back when, but... Um, if you're Swedish, I, you can get away with it. I can get away with it. I, I, I think, it's your job. Yeah. This is what I do in our little game B thing, yeah. You know, but like, I I think that it, as soon as as soon as you have these moralizations, what they are basically is somebody. If you look at that from a completely like only a perspective of raw sort of Freudian, Foucaultian yada yada power agency, it's basically saying, oh, um, I want to affect your. Uh, I want to affect the way you act out in the world without contributing. Like it's literally the opposite of skin in the game. Like now I'm pointing out what's good and bad and you better, you better behave now. It's like, it's not like, it's like the opposite of going, Hmm, you could think like this, or you could think like this. We could follow both through. If you have an intuition now that we should follow only the one, sure. You know, we could gamble to do this one together or only you or only me could follow down that like Socratic path. Uh, and kind of, that's the honest, that's the honest thing, but, but like the complete sort of anti discovery and anti skin in the gameness of going like, yeah, I now say without even contributing as so much as a loaf of bread to this situation, this is what's good. This is what's bad, but it, it, I, the reason I say it feels Protestant. So, it's like it sounds like somebody, what a what a Protestant preacher would say about the, the sort of papacy or something like that. But yeah, they're they're only they're not they're not really Christian. They're only virtue signaling. But yeah, I mean that's. that's I love how you're you're a sweet Protestant and I'm a Portuguese Catholic, and this comes back four hundred years over again. again. Yeah. <laughs> I've been reborn five times since. Yeah. It comes back time and again, <laughs> but I get I get what you mean, and and yeah. that skin in the game aspect is indeed important. Um, I was thinking about when you were talking about that, like that I don't have kids. Maybe when I do, the Machiavellian in me will become more. Oh, there's the, it's this faction that mm-hmm. I'm working for, mm-hmm. not any potential faction. Oh, wow, I've like yeah, and I I don't have kids either, but that that brings up so many. Um, good and bad trips like psychedelic uh, experiences of mine where i'm like oh so i'm in this camp i'm toiling away both sort of with my hands and with my mind oh these are the these are the people i'm really working for yeah dude like, that's oh, crazy no no that was only like that was what they wanted me to think whereas i was actually working for those guys like yeah yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. it's interesting that you mentioned psychedelic trips there was one psychedelic trip that i took my family's village and i started to fucking stare at this bush Uh and i was like fuck like in the same way that this bush has branches and they all stem from the same so am i part of a branch Uh of this place but also a long branch that stems all the way to the Uh big bank and i was like holy shit that's that's the big branch that I'm working towards. Mm. And so when today I have this sort of, you know, I'm going to poke holes and be Machiavellian stance, it's just because I don't trust, uh, uh, I, you know, I want to maximize the territories in the same way that you maximize the territories of analysis. I want to like, mm-hmm. what, are, what are really all the ways that we have? Mm-hmm. Can we switch between them and be a little bit like that to maximize our chances? Because if, I think that's a smart way. Stack. The, the possibilities need to stack on top of each other. That's what uh, Dilbert talks about when it comes to talent. Well, there really has to be, like, if you are a tree and you have, like, so you have all these different roots, right? 
and some of them are you you've built them you 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 just described or they've grown from you like can we have all of these say, capabilities at the same time and switch and communicate between them like some of your roots are going into really fertile soil and you're pumping that shit you're eating away at it every day other roots are maybe have, have dug in at an angle uh into some kind of very poor soil. Now, what makes it poor is only the extent to which it dies. So if it's poor, if somebody comes along and like, oh, this root that you have, man, that's poor soil. Maybe it is, but if it's good enough to sustain itself there, it's gonna balance the tree better. So yeah, a, a root has nourishment functions. But it also has stability, like this is your root, obviously it's surviving. When it starts deteriorating, that's the proof of this was too much going on. Yeah, 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 so the proof's in the pudding. Non-moralistic, yeah, yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. And that's yeah. a very Jewish, uh, mm -hmm. transcendental materialist, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. even a term, I'm just making it up, but the Jewish approach, at least in the Old Testament, which, you know, everybody's heard that Peterson talk where the Jews are like, we were good, therefore God rewards us. So uniting the material proper action of like doing your homework or like doing agriculture well or being a good ruler. And then God, the transcendental element coming and rewarding that and making a covenant, mm -hmm. which is the holiest fucking thing. And when they do not rule properly and they're like hedonistic and they just don't do their homework properly, then God punishes them. So in other words, it's like pissing in the wind and ending up smelling is an, it, pissing in the wind and ending up smelling is two in one. It's both the material action of you decide to piss in the wind and the transcendental outcome, consequence of, oh, I end up smelling. Whose fault is it? Oh, well, Neil deGrasse Tyson is like, oh, well, that's the wind in the at no. no, it's the ideal. It's the fucking mm -hmm. moral attitude of like, why mm -hmm. do you piss in the wind, bro? Like mm -hmm. that there's a rule, there's a transcendental North Star that needs to perhaps guide that, which may or may not be fictional, which may or may not be just a narrative. That's a question that I will leave unanswered because mm. that's where it's best left. However, mm. like, you know, to your point yeah. that you mentioned a while ago, yeah. it's extremely necessary. That is what mythographers do. But the thing that mythographers know is that they both drink their Kool-Aid and they don't. Yeah. Well, I I'm I, rambling. I, I, no, but that's fine. That, and I just want to tie back to where you were talking about. This is far back now. It's, oh, it's so uh, 10 minutes. No, but, but like when you were talking about the vegan chocolate and the meat, like it's so interesting that once you go with the metaphor, which incidentally is a ecology of mind metaphor. Oh, we're working with how are we going to have nice surroundings and also beautiful uh, biodiversity that's blah, 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 blah. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to hone our own tree. And when you get to a certain point of metacognition, you just realize that, yeah, I am self-aware that I am this kind of tree and I'm going to, I'm going to start growing more in that direction. And I'm going to see, Oh, that didn't work. I'm going to maybe sever my ties to that root, whatever. If you can, I don't. then we get into to discussions on free will and all that. But, but the interesting thing about the, the vegan chocolate and the meat is like, if, if the, if the, insight whether it be you know cabalistic or it's as you mentioned or, or something else that if if the insight is that what we are here to do is to somehow bring about the highest capability of blah blah blah, blah and that's going to take you know as far as i can see that's going to take a long time uh how do you know that the nourishment like the nourishment and the culture that you get from the meat eating as opposed to the kind of live in a pod, eat the bugs, uh, eat the vegan chocolate kind of thing. Uh, how do you know, uh, how do you know what's ecologically more sustainable? Like if ecology is to be seen in terms of like how we bring forth the beauty in nature and the nature in beauty and like over time, how the fuck, how do these people know anything about what's, what's most sustainable? So uh, with that said, yes, we need to work, which is why I say, you know, we need to work on lowering our consumption. Do we need to lower our consumption of steak and red wine once in a while? Probably not. We probably need it for our, for our fucking, you know, for our you know, cultural mythopoetic brains with roots back into to time and history for that to function. And the people who sever those ties, I think, are going to lose out. But and I also mm. think the people, I also think the consumptarians who 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 buy new shit uh, made out of plastic every day are also going to lose. It's a celebration. Out. So it's like, yeah. Smart, 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 smartly put, man. 
Very smart. Do we wrap up? <laughs> I think we wrap up. Owen, what uh, do you have anything else? I seemed like you had uh, something in your mind. We've been going for almost two and a half hours. Yeah. So fucking up. That's hmm. a substantial podcast. Yes, indeed. Hang on, my internet just cut out for a second. I mean, I, I'd hate I hate to be the one to because it's your show, and I'm like, are we going <laughs> to wrap up? So, by all means, keep keep you know throwing throwing shit at me, and and uh, for I no mean, other it's... reason than I tried to to uh, hijack your show over here. So, yeah. Oh no, it's been wonderful. Like, yeah. uh, but Daniel, do you want to keep going? Because for me. Like uh, my uh, my football hangover has uh, killed my brain. So ah, I yes, the, the, the gift you received from the referee yesterday. <laughs> yes, the absolute uh, freebie. The skillful. Well, mate, we were fucking dominating them those final half. It an hour. was an invention, <laughs> <laughs> a fabrication. But it was take it. It's football. Be, Foot, you take it. It was it supposed in to be. Now we've just got to go take it to Italy. And... It comes and goes. It comes and goes. But it made me uh, be less pro England because if you had scored in a proper way, I'd be like, "You go, guys." But like with this invention, I'm like, "Ah, maybe it's unfair." But You're just it's bitter football. Because you guys went out early. Come on. I am. Uh, I'm extremely team. bitter. I'm extremely bitter. <laughs> the egotism of Cristiano informs my everyday lived experience. Yes. Portugal has a relationship to Cristiano like Putin has to Russia. Yeah. And with this, I think that I'm overextending the topic of our conversation. So maybe we should wrap up. Daniel, you are the Cristiano Ronaldo of philosophy. That's an underhanded uh, compliment, you asshole. <laughs> it's like being a little bit of a, it's a neg. It's like turning to a girl and say, oh, you're dirty here, babe. <laughs> and you touch her. It was actually, I, 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 because I was nervous for this. I mean, I've never been interviewed in a podcast before. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to prepare. Who are these guys? You know, what, what can I, and I was, and I like my mind made up who you guys are. And I, I thought, you know, and yeah, Cristiano is, is nice, of course. And like, but I think uh, Daniel is, is the Deleuze of the Lusosphere. Uh, uh, and, and <laughs> Owen, I thought you are Russell Brand for smart people. Uh, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, and yeah, basically. Mm. <laughs> That's nice, man. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Well, that said, guys, I guess we should wrap it up. <laughs> Edmund, thank you so much. Thank you. Owen, thank you so much. Guys, everybody, have a good one. Have a good one. Bye bye. Edwin, take care, my man. Take care. I hope you enjoyed the show. Consider becoming our patron and helping us put out more content like this. Patreon.com forward slash Technosocial.